We have a, a new regulatory scheme that essentially allows for a, a traffic uh, speeding ticket sort of fine system um, for low level animal welfare abuses. We have seen um, a couple of significant bills before Parliament uh, that have made real differences uh, to the lives of animals. Um, but I want to show uh, what the biggest development has been in the last uh, 12 months, um, and that has been um, our general election. And many Australian friends of mine have turned their eyes longingly and lovingly eastward uh, in the last 12 months, um, seeing that New Zealand has taken on a, a more progressive government um, in 18th of October, so pretty much just a, a year ago, uh, a Labour-led coalition government was announced. Um, we have a little bit more of a complicated system, or less complicated depending on how you view it, um, but we have a three-way government essentially at the moment. Uh, Labour, which is essentially the equivalent of your ALP here, um, they are the, the largest party. They are in coalition with a much smaller party called New Zealand First. Um, I'm not going to be speaking too much about them. Um, and then they are supported essentially, I guess you could say on the crossbenches would be the equivalent, uh, by the Green Party. The Green Party um, has uh, ministers uh, for the first time. They are outside cabinet, so they are sort of formally part of the, the, small, uh, the small gathering within um, the central part of government, uh, but they still have a significant political sway. And this is the first time that the Green Party has ever had ministers at all. Uh, that's significant because part of the official Green Party policy platform are things like um, a commitment to having a Minister for Animal Welfare, a commitment to ensuring that there is an Animal Welfare Commissioner um, established, and a commitment to a range of uh, relatively uh, progressive animal welfare improvements, a complete ban on battery and colony cages, for example, with regards to battery hens, um, moratoria on dairy farming in uh, significant policy developments that could occur um, because they are formally part of government. So the minute that this was announced, this was a massive shift from what was a relatively conservative approach to animal welfare um, from uh, the national-led government that we had uh, for nine years prior um, and caused a lot of hope uh, and a lot of um, excitement within the animal welfare uh, and animal advocate community within New Zealand, um, as well as a little bit over here as well. I know that there was a lot of excitement about what might happen um, now that we have uh, a 38-year-old uh, mother, newly newly mother and as, as our Prime Minister, uh, who appears on American talk shows uh, and doesn't make a fool of herself um, and doesn't have uh, an acronym like SCOMO. Um, so, the impact of this can't be overstated because more than anything else, uh, a dialogue has occurred that has never occurred before uh, in New Zealand with regards to animal welfare. The Green Party doesn't have a minister uh, installed uh, for animal welfare issues. They have instead focused on, for example, climate change, uh, important issues in terms of uh, social development um, and women. Uh, and that's, that's fine, but what we didn't expect is that a Labour minister actually would take a real interest and focus in terms of animal welfare. Uh, this is, as I'll explain, the former uh, minister, um, Agri Associate Minister um, for uh, Agriculture, uh, Mecca Faitiri. Um, and she is speaking at, uh, sorry, this is quite s s small, at the New Zealand Animal Law Association um, and their launch of a scathing attack of rodeo in New Zealand. Um, it was significant for a bunch of reasons that she was speaking there. We've never had a minister um, who has had any sort of interest at speaking at a non-industry-based event involving animal welfare. Um, and she spoke uh, lucidly, clearly, and warmly about wanting to open a dialogue about, say, the future of rodeo in New Zealand. It was a significant change. So, for example, you probably can't read it, but I'll, I'll read it out for you. Uh, this was from uh, an article that covered the event. Uh, Ms. Faitiri was at the launch of the report on Rodeo Parliament. In her speech notes sent to Radio New Zealand before the event, 
She said she would, quote, not consider a ban on rodeos. However, when she delivered the speech, Ms. Feifley changed her stance, saying she was not looking at a ban, quote, at this point in time. Quote, I've made the statement I won't be banning, but I also want to be open to, if there's new evidence out there, I will at least consider it. You never know what's going to happen in five years. So that's why I said not yet. Compared to the previous administration, which essentially said that rodeo, falsely said that rodeo is a way of life in New Zealand, important to rural communities, and there will never ever be an, even a conversation on banning it or even regulating it, this was a significant change. Uh, and the very existence that we had a minister who was open to talking about animal welfare reform, uh, especially in such a controversial area such as rodeo in New Zealand, uh, was extremely buoyant. Um, so that made me think and made many of uh, my colleagues within the area in New Zealand, there aren't any other animal law teachers in New Zealand, but for example the New Zealand Animal Law Association um, uh, is, has had an existence of only about four or five years but are already a significant player within advocating for animal welfare reform within government and within um, academic circles. It made us feel as if there is a bit of momentum and Jed mentioned momentum, and momentum's really, really important. Getting the wider community involved and getting society interested in animal welfare issues is pretty darn difficult. And if you can get a little bit of momentum on an issue, uh, it can be extremely important. Um, so directly after that event, uh, the minister actually asked a body called the, the National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee, or NAWAC, which is a crown entity within our Ministry for Primary Industries, and it's essentially the Department of Agriculture, um, who provide advice on the establishment of codes of welfare and uh, essentially animal welfare issues. The Minister asked NAWAC for advice about review in March 2018, um, yeah. essentially asking sorry, uh, for advice on whether or not certain events within rodeo ought to be banned from an animal welfare perspective, whether or not rodeo should be banned completely whether or not it has a place in New Zealand any further. Um, the fact that she was using her power and using that body to provide advice about a restriction um, on uh, such events was a significant development. Um, and the Minister had never really done that before, never used that body to provide advice on such a direct way. Uh, usually there was a sort of an arm's length arrangement um, between those two bodies, the Minister and, and NAWAC. Um, and so this really indicated that she was actually putting actions behind uh, what are usually nice, high-sounding words. Again, momentum. Uh, moreover, uh, there was something called an animal welfare hui, which is just a Māori word for a, a meeting of animal uh, welfare advocates um, and animal uh, uh, activists in, 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 in the non-pejorative sense. There was a wide range of, of uh, folk that were uh, attended this hui, um, and uh, from about sort of uh, 60 people from a range of, of, of areas from so SPCA um, and, and sort of relatively sort of moderate folk uh, to relatively radical folk. So uh, New Zealand Anti-Vivisection Society um, uh, were also present uh, as well as uh, Mika Faitabi, the woman that was there, the Minister for Agriculture, Gareth Hughes, who is the Green Party spokesperson um, uh, on animal welfare uh, and New Zealand First's spokesperson for animal welfare, Mark Patterson. That's the three of them there. Um, so they attended this hui. Uh, there was a lot of important discussion, um, and most importantly, something called a framework for action on animal welfare was released uh, shortly after. Um, this is a one page, very nicely designed document, um, but it is important for what it says. Uh, for the first time, we have a, a commitment from government uh, to having an independent voice for animal welfare. This includes exploring options uh, for Commissioner for Animals, establishing a cross-party animal welfare working group within Parliament, and ensuring that independent advisory committees, uh, for example like NAWAC, are supported in their role as an independent voice. Ensuring issues of uh, transparency, identifying what animal welfare information collected by our Ministry can be reported and made publicly available, uh, incre increasing greater participation of interest groups, including from the advocacy's perspective, um, challenging industry to better engage with those groups, uh, ensuring independent advisory committees focus on engagement with those groups, strengthening our codes of welfare and regulations, 
uh, as well as ensuring that there is capacity uh, for folks who are involved uh, within animal wealth, uh, animal industries to actually look after uh, animal welfare as their core priority, uh, as well as probably down the bottom you can't really see here, uh, ensuring that there are additional resources, establishing a dedicated animal welfare, health and welfare unit within the ministry, for example. Uh, this seems to be a framework that could really deliver significant results and would be uh, and would amount to nothing more than a, a significant uh, systemic change within the New Zealand animal welfare system. This was the momentum that we were hoping for. These, this was the change uh, and the forward thinking um, that many of us just assumed would never actually take place. This was a remarkable shift. I know that I'm building up the sort of the positive, the positive, the positive, the positive before I, um, I, I, I let you all down. Uh, so now I want to talk about whether or not that momentum has stalled, whether or not it was phantom momentum in the first place. Um, and but I want to talk about that because it's important to discuss the, the, the good conversations that have occurred, but then really look at whether or not they're actually having much of an impact and whether or not they will have an impact, whether or not the light at the end of the tunnel uh, is just another oncoming train. So it's really unclear whether or not this framework is going to achieve any particular um, substantive gains of the type that it says that it focuses on. What I mean by that is that we have a framework but no plan for its implementation. And after the framework has been released, there has essentially been a deafening silence as to exactly what's going to happen with that framework. Now it's on us as animal welfare um, advocates uh, and those who can pressure governments who live up to the framework now that it's really there to focus on its implementation and to pressure government to essentially commit to its implementation. Of course there is. Um, but at the same time, since we saw so much positive dialogue coming from government and often them taking the lead on these sorts of issues, uh, it has been concerning uh, that the months that have preceded, so it's been about so five months since that came out, there has been no indication as to exactly what's going to happen with that framework. Moreover, it's very clear that the government department, the Ministry for Primary Industries, uh, that would be responsible for uh, implementing it and, and changing its systems, doesn't really have much of a keen interest. Uh, and there have been concerns that this might simply have been an easy way to uh, mollify the animal advocacy groups that attended that meeting uh, in in May uh, and may not necessarily lead to action. Nevertheless, something to work with. But the other things that are much more concerning that have occurred in the last few months um, indicate that the symbolism uh, might be a real uh, problem. There have been significantly disappointing responses uh, to two major undercover exposés that have occurred in New Zealand. Uh, the first, and I don't like putting pictures up of, of what uh, the expose is involved, so I'll, uh, I'll describe it. You can probably visualise what, what it all is. Uh, the first was direct animal actions undercover footage of a broiler chicken farm in New Zealand. Uh, they managed to um, walk in uh, to a facility which showed that essentially all of the minimum standards that we have for broiler chicken facilities were being breached uh, by our major chicken producer in New Zealand. Uh, there was just a significant level of, um, of, of breaches, uh, just basic things like adequate food, uh, water, uh, access to uh, those things, ventilation, um, clearly no uh, uh, diagnosis of disease, clearly no um, sort of responses to those chickens um, who simply couldn't uh, walk. It was, uh, a, there were a range of distressing images that occurred um, and that were released. The response, uh, firstly, by the government was upsetting, uh, which was essentially, uh, we will just get our regulatory, regulatory authorities to look at this. The response by the regulatory authorities was extremely distressing, which was, eventually we had a look and we didn't see any problems. We've talked to the producers and they say that there were no problems. And then the response from industry as well as um, the general media, which was, well, maybe the animal advocates set this up. Maybe they actually distressed the chickens themselves. It was just a depressing example of 
essentially what had always occurred before, uh, which was to paint animal um, advocates as the real trespassers and the real wrongdoers in this situation, um, and government not backing them up and not forcing the sort of things that the framework was insisting upon uh, was a little bit distressing. Um, similarly, the second uh, expose um, involved uh, not undercover as such, but drone footage of uh, a feedlot in uh, South Canterbury, so in the South Island of New Zealand. Um, this, this imagery was taken by uh, essentially, uh, just be bold here and say, sort of voices as sort of sister organisation, um, Safe or Save Animals from Exploitation in New Zealand. They took drone footage of these facilities, which no one in New Zealand had ever even knew that they existed. Uh, essentially, these are feedlots to, to, to fatten up um, cattle uh, before slaughter. Um, and there was a lot of outrage as to uh, the existence of these feedlots. We have this persistent image in New, Zealand's, um, New Zealanders' minds of uh, cattle consistently being free range and that meaning that they are on green pastures um, with, with uh, basically all the facilities they need to have a good life. The response to this footage uh, from industry uh, was that uh, these are vegan fundamentalists and the response from the, the minister, um, so Mika Faitari, the woman that I referred to earlier, she was the associate minister for agriculture, the, the main minister for ag agriculture, um, his response was deeply problematic. He stated, and I will read this out because you probably can't read it, I can barely read it, uh, quote, clearly it is not the mainstream type of production, these feedlots for New Zealand, but we are open to innovative ways to produce good quality beef. This is one of them. Clearly the image of pastoral farming is the one New Zealand promotes, and it is the mainstay of our industry. That's the clean green um, bull, so much to speak. Um, minister O'Connor, this is the minister I was referring to, said that SAFE had to, quote, uh, live in the real world, quote, we appreciate their views that New Zealand would be crippled if we listened to everything that they said. So we are hearing, therefore, positive dialogue from one person, very negative dialogue from another person, and uh, he, as the, the head minister, the main minister of agriculture, uh, really does call shots on implementing such things as that framework for animal welfare, uh, for resourcing of his department, the primary industries. And so this was deeply concerning, and it did make us, me, wonder whether or not all the platitudes uh, that had occurred um, in the last few months was simply uh, phantom. Moreover, if I can go back to the response that NAWAC, the National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee, had to the Minister's uh, request for advice about the existence of rodeo, uh, this was also deeply concerning. Uh, NAWAC assembled a panel of experts that talked to the rodeo uh, industry and advocacy groups for that industry before producing its report. It deliberately and in my mind inexcusably excluded considerations about uh, the political or social place of rodeo within New Zealand and opposition to rodeo within New Zealand and instead focused purely on whether or not particular events um, have particular animal welfare impacts. Their ultimate response, however, was the most concerning thing. This is part of the, the response that um, concerns me most. With respect to the issue of the welfare of animals at rodeos as a whole and the issue of calves in rodeo, the committee is recommending a suite of non-regulatory actions that are aimed at encouraging self-regulation in the industry, which will address those aspects not covered, currently covered by legislation. No real action on rodeo will occur as a result of this report, because NAWAC says that there is actually no problem with rodeo in and of itself. That's notwithstanding the fact that the SPCA uh, vehemently opposes the existence of rodeo. That's notwithstanding the fact that the ministry doesn't have any uh, clear uh, role for um, monitoring rodeo events. Uh, the self-regulation that is occurring in rodeo is essentially the same sort of self-regulation that occurs in thoroughbred horse racing in New Zealand uh, and Australia, which we know is an abysmal failure given that the sets of incentives are all um, aimed at not really sort of exposing animal welfare issues. 
and ignores the broader question of the legitimacy of rodeo in New Zealand in the first place. Uh, New Zealand Animal Law Association's report uh, came out fairly clearly uh, that it is a modern event only uh, started in the 1960s in New Zealand that serves no greater societal purpose and is a low attended um, and problematic event um, that ought to be phased out uh, given its limited utility. Uh, NAWIC didn't address that, it simply looked at sort of very um, selective science in some respects uh, and came out with a really disappointing response. Again, another indication perhaps uh, that momentum has stalled on the issue. So, what are the lessons that we can take from this? Apart from not getting your hopes up. Um, the biggest lesson in my mind is that personalities matter. Um, why, wh while the election of a Labour League government was uh, something to be really excited about, there were some sad parts to that. Uh, Mojo Mathers um, was a, oopsie daisy, um, a, an MP in the last parliament for the Green Party. Um, she, presumably, uh, you don't know too much about her, but uh, she was um, completely and profoundly deaf uh, and, and an incredible uh, advocate for uh, those of the, um, in the disabilities community, uh, but also a staunch advocate for animal welfare. Uh, was the Green Party's spokesperson for animal welfare, established most of their policy platforms regarding animal welfare, and was their fiercest advocate. The loss of her as an MP, um, the way that New Zealand's proportional system of elections work, means that she just didn't get in because the Green Party didn't get enough of the vote. Um, the loss of her meant that the Green Party really lost its, its line um, for animal welfare. And although uh, Gareth Hughes, who is now the spokesperson, is doing a, a good job, it's lacking the same sort of momentum. Had she been in Parliament, it could quite um, well have happened that uh, an animal welfare minister might have been negotiated out of a coalition agreement. The lack of her has been significant. Similarly, Trevor Mallard, uh, who is part of the Labour Party, uh, was the Labour Party's first animal welfare spokesperson. Uh, he was elected to Speaker of the House of Representatives of New Zealand uh, and his animal welfare role was just not uh, continued, it was disestablished because again, he was the one that was pushing it and he was the one that was forcing Labour to confront animal welfare issues. Uh, Mika Whaiteri, it's a, it's a kind of sad story. Um, uh, Mika was uh, accused of uh, shoving one of her staff members uh, and was promptly removed um, from her ministerial responsibilities and demoted as a minister. Uh, and that occurred a few months ago. And while that's obviously inexcusable behaviour, uh, the lack of her and her advocacy, which no one really knew was on the, on the radar, but she ended up being quite a champion uh, for animal welfare issues. The lack of her presence means that the other minister, the one who really disregards uh, any sort of opposition to feedlots, for example. Um, the, he's going to be the only voice for uh, agriculture within New Zealand, uh, and it lacks the moderating influence that she has had. Uh, no one has been really uh, sort of promoted to fill the void uh, that has occurred in her absence. Um, and to provide sort of an Australian sort of uh, Responses as Susan Lee is, which was already uh, sort of focused on by by Jed with regard to live export. I know that she was obviously a bit player in the grand scheme of things in terms of banning live export, but her bringing a bill before the Senate and her sort of challenging her Liberal colleagues made a significant difference in terms of the momentum of the issue. Similarly, her not necessarily progressing the bill and the bill failing really stalled some of the momentum that was occurring in that issue. It turns out that particular people within government and within parliament really matter in terms of actually establishing a dialogue, continuing that momentum and ensuring that change actually occurs. And so the ultimate issue that um, is probably the New Zealand experience has shown in the last 12 months is that significant versus symbolic progress is really, really difficult. We've had symbolic progress in New Zealand now for the last sort of 20 years. Our legislation is bona fide, the best animal welfare legislation that you can get in the world. It's implementation, uh, the whether or not it actually has an impact on the lives of animals is a different issue altogether. 
I assumed that the dialogue that we were seeing, the fact that we have new animal advocacy groups within New Zealand that are doing really well researched and really interesting work on the issue would start to create some of that significant change. Uh, I am once again at the end of, of the year left a little bit jaded, a little bit cynical as to whether or not anything more than fancy graphs, uh, fancy press releases and nice words are all we're going to get from uh, the animal welfare uh, sector and animal welfare leadership within New Zealand. And I hate to leave on a depressing note, we are doing some great things in New Zealand but it's clear that we're going to have to work a lot harder to see significant change in development and improvements uh, in animal welfare uh, in New Zealand. Thanks very much.